You were not meant to be a slave to the grind. You were not meant to trade your life force for money. You can escape gravity. You can unlock your life. You got this. Let's go. Hello and welcome to Unlock Your Life. I'm your host, Jennings Smith. I appreciate you being with me today, but I'm not alone. I've got a guest. I'm here with Patrick Verano. He is an author. He wrote a book called The Leadership Bridge. He also owns the Emory Leadership Group, emoryleadershipgroup.com. He's a leadership and sales coach. He's a TEDx speaker, and he helps people and companies navigate conflict, build resilience, and achieve excellence in what they're doing. Patrick also has his own podcast called Learning from Leaders. And I was connected to Patrick through a good friend of mine and wanted to have him on the show, hear his story, and um, see what we can learn from him. So Patrick, welcome. Welcome to Unlock Your Life. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. I always appreciate any opportunity to come in and talk about areas that we can improve and develop ourselves, whether it's uh, leadership or personal development. So happy to be here. Yeah, man. So tell me a little bit about what you do. Maybe, uh, you know, you just wrote your book, The Leadership Bridge, this past summer. What was the drive for that? And how are you helping people? And how did you get into this? Yeah. So um, how I got into it was I actually, I worked in the biotech industry for about 15 years. And when I was in there doing sales and training, I always loved the development component of it. And I would say it even goes back further than that to go back to my own family. I'm the youngest of 10. So I think being in that (laughs) environment, there was always conflict or challenge or things that I just always enjoyed looking at how to solve things, how to help sort of figure things out. And that just sort of translated over into when I started a career in pharmaceuticals and got involved in training. But at, at a point when I was in that industry, I had a manager that my last one that we just didn't see eye to eye on a lot of things. And I was at a point in my career where I was frustrated. I wanted to do more and didn't feel like I was really living my best life where I wanted to go. And it got really uncomfortable for me. And, and probably looking back on it, it was my own doing, really. I think I self-sabotaged myself in a lot of regards because it forced me to leave an industry that was healthy six-figure industry that I had very, very little concerns. Um, I had a, a company car. We did programs. I ate at great restaurants, all of these things. I had a lot of flexibility, but I was really unhappy. Again, I just didn't feel like I was, I was fulfilling really what I was meant to do, what my purpose was. And it was at that point that uh, I actually got put on my first ever performance improvement plan. So for any of those that have worked (laughs) in an organization, you know that the PIP is probably the sign that you need to probably look at doing something else. And I had been thinking all along, like, I want to go off and and do this. And that was the push that I needed. And I I said right before we got here that to me, when we go to entrepreneurship, we trade security for freedom. And that's really what I did. Yeah, that's so true. Um, I posted something about how basically that you're relying on someone else to cut you your paycheck until you're willing to cut your own paycheck. But in doing that, you take on all those stresses and pressures and you're at the whim of, you know, your boss is the general public. Your bosses do the people want what I'm offering, right? Totally. And if they don't, they'll let you know very quickly, you know, through, yeah. through no sales. <laughs> yeah. And along those lines, it's funny because if you think about it, when I have people that, that I talk to now that I was just on the phone with somebody that saw one of my posts from the industry that I didn't talk to in probably 10 years. And it was like, boy, I can't believe you finally, you did it. And, you know, you took that leap. And I feel more secure where I am than where they are because they're relying on somebody else to, to potentially allow them to keep their job or, or whatever that might be. Whereas for me, I get to decide every day what's going to happen for me. And that's not to say that working for an organization is a bad thing. It's just for me, from a standpoint of security, I feel like I have more security now than when I worked for an organization. You know, and that's, it's so foreign to me that, that feeling of security, because I feel very secure. I know that I can find other clients. I know that I can find other income streams. And I think that once you know, hey, I know how to make money. My dad said that he's seen people that, you know, they've made a million dollars and they go broke. They make another million dollars because they know how to make a million dollars now. And there's so many people that they think it's just lightning in a bottle. It happened. They got lucky one time. But once you master that skill, you can do it again. You know, and that brings a lot of self-confidence. 
Yeah. And, you know, for me, I will say, I think I had a little bit of a leg up coming from a background of sales. I felt like if I can't sell myself the most important product I have, I'm not very good. Right. I mean, that's. You don't believe in your product enough if you can't, you know, if you can't sell it and you don't have that confidence. If you can't sell someone, you can't help them. That's almost like a dirty word of like, oh, I don't want to be sold. And But if you can't convince somebody or, or show them the value of what you're doing, how can you help them in a meaningful way? Yeah. Without them investing their time and money into your product. And there's that bridge built there. Yeah, without question. Without question. So let's talk about your company and what you do and how you help people and corporations and, and, and what is the need for that that you see. Yeah. So the company is a, the direct result, I think, of, of the frustration that I was finding in the setting that I was in. I looked around and thought, boy, there's so much potential here. There are so many opportunities I think are missed within organizations in terms of the way be, we behave, mm-hmm. um, especially the way leaders behave toward those people that report to them. And I had the good fortune of, of the last position I had was I wasn't in a management position. I was a follower. And what I mean by that is I... I reported to a manager and didn't have anybody that reported to me. And that provided me with a great opportunity to really think of what is it that's important for leaders to understand if they want people to want to follow them. And the way I look at leadership really is think of it as it's a product that whether you think of it as a physical product or as a service, but if you were to sell something else, a service or a a physical product, Oftentimes you do market research to find out what's the appetite for the market on this. Who will buy this, right? Here's the thing that I'm putting out there. Does the public want this? Hmm. And I think the same thing can be said for leadership. And the research has already been done through Gallup surveys and Press Ganey surveys and a lot of research on what motivates people and what social needs employees have. And that if we want people to buy our leadership, then the market research has already been done to say, these are the things that you need to deliver to the employee. You provide them these things and they will buy your leadership. That's really, really valuable because I think, at least for me, I think people think like I think, you know, you know how you think and what motivates yeah. you intrinsically and externally. And, and, and you think that everyone's probably going to be motivated by the same things that you are. And a lot of times that's not because you're a different type of person, which is why you're out there starting the company, being the entrepreneur. And they just have, you have different motivations than say somebody that is a, you know, the COO or, or, or a top salesperson even, or, or the yeah. person that's the data analyst. I mean, they all have probably different motivations. And I remember a lot of my, I used to lead a construction company and we have had maybe 10 or 12 employees at the most. And a lot of my leadership style it fell flat, you know, it didn't motivate because I think I was trying to motivate from what I wanted to hear instead of like what the market wanted. Yeah. And that is so true. And I think that can oftentimes be the biggest challenge, especially for in a sales environment. And that's where I spent most of my time. So that's what I come from about how many people were promoted that were incredible salespeople. They get promoted to a management role and they fall on their face because what they tend to do is they try and manage everybody from the same way they were successful. And it doesn't Mm -hmm. work, right? (laughs) Because they're not everybody else. So then everybody's frustrated. The person they're trying to manage is frustrated because you're asking them to change how they would normally do things. And I'm frustrated as a manager because I think, why don't you follow me? Look at what I did. I was successful. If you just do what I did, you will be successful. And I think one of the things that we have to recognize is that there are multiple routes to success, right? Just because I do it a certain way, yeah, it worked for me, but that doesn't mean it's going to work for you. And again, I think that's where the work that I do with not only sort of a frontline manager, but also all the way up to an executive level, because I think that's a whole additional challenge when somebody's at an executive level, because a lot of times they think that they're successful by default, right? They just lead because they're at the top. So they already got this figured out. And in the environment that we're in right now, I would challenge many of those that think that things are just the way they've always been. And I'm just going to lead the way I've, I've done are going to be disappointed with the way that their employees probably try to navigate or migrate out of their organization. Gotcha. Gotcha. So who is your avatar? Like, can you tell me maybe even a story of of a client that you helped recently? Like, what's an issue that they, it's a big enough problem that they're motivated. Like, I got to talk to Patrick. I got to get this solved. I got to get this figured out. And they're willing to 
invest in in, in your company and, and bring you on and, and do this? What what are they yeah. facing? Yeah. So I'll give you one new example that happened to me just over the past couple of days. So there's a hospital I'm doing some work with and they have a, a frontline manager. So I was brought in by the director because the director has two employees that continue to bypass their who they're supposed to report to and they go directly to this director. And it's causing a lot of frustration for this director because he's like, well, I've got a manager here that's supposed to be sort of handling this. And these people don't feel a level of trust or whatever they're going around this person. So when I was asked to come in and talk to them, the director wants to have a conversation with me about how to deal with this. What he sees as two problem employees that are overstepping the manager. That's really not what's going on here, though. The manager has a role here, too. And as we dig deeper, I said, I, what I'd like to do is have an interview with both the employees one-on-one -on -one, to get their perspective on things. I want to hear what they think is going on. And I also want to talk to the manager to find out their perspective on things, right? Because we all have our own sort of perception on how things happen. Well, in this case, you have a manager that was never trained, has been in a role for a year now, but never had any training in regards to how do you have conversations? How do you manage conflict? What are the best ways to sort of create positive communication with employees, set clear expectations? So these two employees feeling frustrated, they bypass this person, yet it's really not the manager's fault fully because they haven't been given the skill set to be able to deal with it. So my role now in going back in is to work really with all three of them, is to work with the manager from a skill set standpoint but also work with the two employees to improve their skills in terms of how they can advocate for what they want and how they can communicate better, right? Because it's not just one person's fault here. So three people are really involved here. I mean, I saw that in my company where people would jump straight to me. And, and a lot of times it was because there was just not really trust or respect of their opinion. Yeah. Well, what does Jennings think? Let's go right to Jennings instead of this guy who I'm not going to agree with what he has to say. I just don't, I don't trust him or her. And I think that, yeah, it, a lot of times it is the person who is getting leapfrogged. They just haven't developed that authority. But then again, a lot of times the boss is the problem too, because they like that. It strokes your ego like, oh yeah, I'm the one with all the answers. <laughs> they say they want you great. to go to the manager, but they're always willing to give their advice and jump in. Yeah, you know? Jenny, you, you bring up a great point there because so in this situation with this director, the conversation was basically you're promoting this too by not sort of setting the expectations of you need to, this needs to filter through the manager first. You have, in a sense, created this environment that you're now calling me on to try and fix. Right. So the director right. needs direction too in terms of, of what they should be doing, what this needs to look like when we start doing the work to make sure that everybody sort of falls in line. Okay. So when I was learning about you, reading about you, one of the first things you talk about is you help people navigate conflict. And I think that that's probably one of the biggest issues that, that corporations face, individuals face in, in yeah. friendships with your kids, with your wife, employees. Why is conflict so hard? Well, you know, why, why is conflict so hard to deal with and how do you give people the tools to deal with that? Yeah, I think conflict is difficult oftentimes because we confuse being difficult on problems or issues that we might be facing with being difficult on each other. And that's really what happens. It devolves not from where we're dealing with the issue, but it becomes personal. And we generally don't like conflict. I think we have a hard time with that. Some people do, but most people, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Some people enjoy it, but I think for the wrong reasons, right? Not about being productive. So one of the things that I use with a lot of the clients that I will work with is a personality assessment based on DISC, but it's not DISC uh, for a, a general workplace. I use one that's called DISC for conflict. And the reason I use that one is because as you say, oftentimes when I'm called into an organization, it's not, hey, Patrick, can you come in? We're doing such a great job on everything. And we just want you to come in and, and kind of pat us on the back and tell us how great <laughs> we are. It's they want me to come in because there's a challenge that they haven't been able to navigate themselves. So when I go in and work with these organizations, I will use or utilize as one of the tools is this disk for conflict, because what it does is it provides individuals as they take this assessment to understand 
how their personality style responds to conflict. Yeah. Yeah. And that's that's like a starting point. And it's almost like an aha moment for a lot of people. And they're like, you know what? I get it. You know, that makes sense to me how I sort of show up like that at times. Or now that I know this other person, you know, and I know their style, it makes more sense to me why they avoid having conversations with me. It's because that's part of their sort of natural style of personality. Now, that's not meant to give people excuses for not having productive conflict. It's simply an opportunity to identify where does this come from? Because once we start to do that, we can change our approach to how we interact with them. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Now, I will say there might be listeners that are thinking, well, that's great if everybody you deal with takes a disc assessment to be able to do this. (laughs) <laughs> and the work that we do, we say, right, you can't say, look, before I have conflict with you, can you tell me what your disc profile is, what your personality style is, so I know how to interact best. We don't need that. There are some very simple ways that we talk about in terms of how you start to build an awareness of being able to tell just by somebody's language, how they respond to something, where their personality style probably is, because we're only talking about four different ones. Gotcha. Yeah. I read something. It was... Without conflict, there can be no unity. And I see that where sometimes it's not worth having conflict with somebody if I don't want to have unity with them. It's like, just let it go. But if you want to have unity, like a marriage or a key employee or a workplace environment, I think there's going to be conflict. There has to be conflict and it has to be done in a productive manner. And human beings, unfortunately, we seem to like to push and take and, and we need the counterpart to push back, right? To have that equilibrium of a healthy relationship. I mean, I see that in my marriage and I wouldn't say we fight a lot, but there's definitely conflict where I'm like, hey, that's a boundary that I can't cross or don't want to cross with yeah. her and vice versa. And it's good to talk about it and have that conversation versus just stew about it or bury it or shove it or whatever, you know, have these unhealthy reactions to that. Yeah, without question. We need conflict. Conflict is how we grow. And again, that's what we call it productive conflict is that when we approach it the right way, when we're hard on problems and not on each other, it's not personal anymore. It's about we've got an issue here that we need to resolve and it might get uncomfortable and probably will. But our commitment here is towards solving the problem, not attacking each other. So how can we have productive conflict versus unproductive conflict? So I think first there's an awareness of what our needs are. We all have there are two models that I use whether it's conflict or just working with organizations to improve engagement. And the first is a model by a neuroscientist named David Rock. And he developed a model back in 2008 called SCARF. And it's an acronym. And it's based on five social needs that we all have. So the first one in SCARF is status. That we all have a need for status, right? And not about a title, but about feeling as though we're respected. So you Mm -hmm. can think we're in a conversation. If you and I are, are disagreeing, and I'm talking down to you or being dismissive, then I've, I've violated your level of status. I basically said, you're not as important as I am. And when that happens, we do one of two things. When status is supported, the way we behave toward each other is good, it, we seek it. It's like a reward. But when we don't see it there, we avoid it, right? And these are all based on science to the point that what they've done is these social needs have been identified and they, they are active in the brain the same place as our needs for food and water. These are vital to us. Right? It's not just these are nice to have things. These are things that we all, we all need. So the next one is around certainty. Right? We like to have some sense of where things are going and what the rules are. And, you know, personalities come into that too, right? If you're somebody that I don't know who's going to show up if you're volatile sometimes and I want to bring up this issue and all of a sudden you blow off the handle at me because you don't want me bringing that up. There's a lack of certainty that I have in, how, in terms of how I even can approach you on stuff. So I avoid, right? So the next is around autonomy. We all sense a need for having some control over our destiny, where we're going. And when you think about that, if we're in conflict, right, autonomy could be as much as me asking you what your thoughts are on this. How would you like to see this resolved, right? I'm not just going to tell you what we're going to do. I'm asking you to be a participant in this, Mm. right? Okay. So the next is around relatedness. This is the next social need we have in in this SCARF model. And it's about feeling connected, right? Feeling as though we're, there's a lot of research on what they call the in-group versus the out-group. And that we want to feel as though we're part of the in-group. So I would say as 
as managers, as leaders, it's our responsibility from a team standpoint is to make sure that people feel included in, in terms of what's going on. And when people don't feel included, generally bad things happen. And again, I go back to, uh, we're pack animals, if you think about it, right? Is that yeah. if I were voted outside of the group or tribe I was in thousands of years ago, that probably was a death sentence, right? I couldn't survive on my own. And I would say very much the same thing. We get voted outside of groups today and it's, we still suffer, but in a different way on that. We need to feel as though we're connected to the groups we're with. And when we do that, we're more likely to be collaborative on how we solve problems if we feel like we're all part of the same team here. We're in this together. You know, I've found that to be such a great technique and really a, just a breakthrough of not solving the problem for people, <laughs> but giving them the autonomy to come up with a collaborative solution or their own solution, which yeah. they're going to trust and believe in. And I used to just be that bulldozer, like, do this, do this, do this, do this. It'll work. I've done it that way. I know it'll work. Like, don't question it. And that is, you're not getting that buy-in. That's where you get people to totally. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Sure. And, and they don't do it. <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's what we would call it extrinsic motivation versus when you get them to create their own roadmap in terms of how they're going to solve this, it becomes intrinsic. And to me, it's easier to hold them accountable to that because I can always go back to you and say, hey, Jennings, you know what? A week ago, you told me that you were going to, this is what you thought you could do to, to take care of this. And I'm kind of seeing a pattern here again. What's going on? What changed between our conversation and now? So right. even in that, I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt because maybe I'm missing something here, but I'm going to give you that autonomy to tell me what's going on here. I'm not just going to ride you for, you're not doing what you said you were going to do. I'm going to be curious about it. And then I can always come in after that and be like, well, we're going to have to figure something else out because this isn't going to work, which I think plays into the last social need that we have is around fairness, right? That's the F in the scarf model is that we want to feel as though we're treated equally. So on a team, right? And we've probably all been on those that we feel like some people get preferential treatment. They don't have to follow the same rules. And when that happens, it creates disengagement. It creates resentment. It pits people against each other because they're like, you know, you don't have to do the things that I have to do. You show right. up late and nothing happens. I show up late and I get a lecture on it. We want fairness. All right. I got four kids, so I hear you on that one. They're right. all about the fairness. <laughs> yeah, they're all about the fairness. There was an exercise that I came across because I used to talk about this in regards to how do we create fairness? And it was, think about it as, as with your kids, if there's one piece of cake, but there's two of them and they're going to fight over, you know, who gets what piece? You say one person gets to cut it and the other person gets to choose which piece they want. So if you think about it, right, whoever's cutting this, they know that they have a vested interest. They better make this thing <laughs> they're laser. Gonna be, yeah, they're going to be very careful. Cut <laughs> because the other person's going to choose the slice that they want first. And I think that's a way to create fairness, right? We're both in this together. Yeah, yeah. It benefits me to make sure I, I make this fair because you're going to choose which work detail you want. It can be used wherever if you think about it. We've used this, it's called a Texas shootout clause in some contracts where essentially if one partner wants to buy the other out, he can make that partner an offer, but the other partner has the right to buy his shares at the offer. Great. Same thing. He can't make too low of an offer. Like, you know what? I don't want that offer, but I'll buy your shares at that price. If you yeah, think that's you what much. they're worth, great. you know, I'll do it. And uh, yeah, keeping us honest and... That status, I think, is huge with the employee incentivization because we always think it's the bottom line. It's the dollar. That's what they care about, the money. And a lot of times, yeah, it's, hey, they have seniority with the days that they get to take off or they got recognized at the company, you know, conference or Christmas party that they're the top salesperson. Those status things, or they got their special parking spot, right? That's closest to the building. Those things that are extremely important to certain people. I mean, I was part of a franchise organization for a couple of years and they gave awards. And actually, you know, I still got the awards so I'm up there on the bookshelf, you know, that I won franchisee of the year and I got recognized. And nobody outside of that circle, out that uh, tribe cares, but that tribe knew what it meant. Yeah. And that was my, you know, relatedness tribe. And so it meant a lot to me to get that status award. Yeah. You know, interesting, especially around retention right now. And you mentioned something right in the, in the very beginning that it's not about money. Oftentimes, I mean, money obviously has got to be, there's got to be equity. Like if the company down the street does the exact same thing and they're, they're paying 50% more than, well then, yeah, I might have obligations with my family. I'm going to look to go down there, but more than not, 
if we've created an environment where people feel a sense of relatedness, if that social need has been satisfied, then we can probably all think of those groups where you're like, eh, looks like a great offer, but I know what I have here. I've got a great situation. I'm not leaving this for a couple dollars more, you know, because I know what I have here. And I think organizations miss an opportunity there to do something that's very inexpensive. I don't have to up my benefits. I don't have to up my pay. I just have to, as a leadership group, find a way to create environments where people feel as though they that belong more to this organization. Yeah. Create a culture of that. Awesome. Yeah. So Patrick, who are you looking to help? Who is your avatar? I want to know, like, if I'm facing an issue, I mean, are we looking for entrepreneurs? Are we looking for larger corporations? You mentioned a hospital. Who are you best suited to help? Yeah, that's an interesting question. You know, I mean, obviously everybody wants to paint their avatar. I would say my avatar is the person that is struggling in a relationship with somebody else that needs to gain their agreement on something or to get them to sort of follow where they're asking them to go. And they're having a difficult time doing that. They don't know the tools or the, the approaches that they might take that might help them to ethically get this person to go in their direction. And I, and I stress that ethically because I think there's a lot of research. I spent a lot of time and was trained in a model through an expert named Robert Cialdini out of uh, Arizona State University. And he identified six principles of influence and they're legitimate, right? There's a lot of research behind these six principles and I won't go into them now, but just to say you could Google that and find out. But when you find ways to satisfy those principles and activate those principles in other people, you are more likely to get them to say yes to your request, but it needs to be done ethically. And mm -hmm. there are a lot of people around us that we can see have used these same principles, but for unethical endeavors. You know, I was reading the book, 48 Laws of Power. You may have heard of that. It's kind of like how to influence people and in some ways how to manipulate people. Yeah. It's an interesting book. And I definitely, there were some things that I could take out of it that were positive, but there was a lot that was just like, I mean, yeah, that would work. Sleazy. Right. And I mean, what, and one of the tactics, you talked about certainty in the scarf model. And one of the tactics was not giving people certainty, like changing your personality, blowing up at them one minute, being calm, keeping people on their toes and almost like governing through a, a fear. And yeah, I mean, maybe these despot rulers of the Middle Ages, I mean, it was an effective tactic, I'm sure. But it's like, is that who you really want to be? And I, th I think you got to be careful with some of this. Even sales stuff. I mean, if you're not coming from a place of genuine helping people, is this what this person needs? Is this product going to serve them? Or am I just trying to make a commission? You're right. You know? And eventually you're going to get found out when you do that. Right. I mean, eventually right. it's not going to work in your favor anymore. And we talk about it in terms of goodwill. People can sense that. Is what you're asking me to do, it is, is it only in your best interest or are you thinking about my best interest too? Right. When we don't have goodwill with other people, then they're more likely to say no to our request. Or if they do have to say yes, an employee, they're resistant to doing that because they're like, you know what, I'm having to do something that really benefits you, but I get no benefit from this, really. Right. That seeking to understand. If, if we feel understood yeah. by the other person, that they, yeah. they understand our problem, they understand what we need, I think we're a lot more likely to trust and engage with them. I think that oh, can yeah. be some of my failings as leadership in leadership was just, was I really understanding with the needs of my employees and my team? So. Yeah, that's our foundation, right? If we don't have trust with somebody else, then the likelihood that they're going to follow us because they want to is very low. Right. So Patrick, how can we connect with you? How can the guests connect with you if they want to reach out to you to salvage your relationship, repair a relationship, if they're facing something like that, what's the best way to connect? With yeah. You? So you can uh, reach out to me. LinkedIn is where I spend a lot of my time. So um, if you just sort of Google my name, you can pull me up there. I love grabbing new connections on there too. So you'll see a lot of the work that I put out there. My website is uh, emeryleadershipgroup.com and it's E-M-E-R-Y, not like the college. It's E-M-E-R-Y leadershipgroup.com. The book that I published in June of this year is The Leadership Bridge, How to Engage Your Employees and Drive Organizational Excellence. And it's more than just a leadership book. It's a leadership book for any aspect of your life same behaviors work, whether you're at home in the community or in an office setting. It just came out on Audible last week. So you have your pick. If you don't like to read, you can listen to it. Gotcha. Awesome. Well, Patrick, I had a lot of fun hanging out with you. Appreciate yeah, you sharing so your story. 
Thank you, and we'll talk soon. Bye. This is the podcastfactory.com.